Hey, everybody. Excited for another week on the podcast. Today it's going to look a little bit different, but we're uh, very excited. Uh, Mike is traveling this week, and I forget where he's even at this week, but traveling again. And our travel schedule is going to be, you know, really amping up over these next couple of weeks and couple of months. But nonetheless, even if we're remote, we're going to keep cranking out episodes. Um, today joining me on the podcast is, we're very excited to have our compliance officer, I am Heather, Heather Woody. Woody. So Heather, go ahead and why don't you just explain to our listeners, you know, your background, your role here, yep. and more like your experience in the industry. Yep. So I've been in the Medicare industry for 15 years. Um, started out with one of the big box call centers, eHealth, mm-hmm. um, on their sales side. I grew to be one of their top selling agents, but part of the way that I became a top selling agent was reading compliance guidelines. Um, for better or for worse, it helped me to be a better salesperson to know the compliance side as well. Mm-hmm. And um, so in growing to be one of the top salespeople, then I also grew to be into management and worked with eHealth for five years, then moved on to another call center and helped them build their call center from the ground up. Became well known as someone who helped build the right way. And then three years ago, joined the Agent Boost Marketing. Um, in addition three to... Three years. It, I just, we were talking before the podcast, yeah. and I was like, it's been like two, and you're like, no, it's been three years. Three and years. It, I blinked, and it's been three years. Yep. So. Yep. From the little teeny place on Sandy. Yep. In yep. New York. That's true. It's where we are now. Where we are now. Yeah. That's great. So, yeah. So, so before, when you were helping that other call center, you helped them build... A lot of it was very process oriented, I imagine, right? It and was actually very understanding like here's the, the processes and why you need to build and how and you know, there's actually a lot that goes into compliance, which we're gonna get into. Yep. And all the listeners are just ecstatic to be talking about compliance, I'm sure. <laughs> but anyways, but yeah, so that's those were the, some of the activities you were doing. And that was actually the reason like when we had our initial interview, a lot of those questions that I was prodding and asking you about too yep. is like right, we we always ask when we're screening people is not we don't like people who can talk in theory or um, talk conceptually about things. We like people who have actually done it, who yep. know it by experience and doing it. I'm, I'm sure I prodded you about those. Absolutely. Things. So it took a little while for you to make your decision, but good uh, place to land here at Agent Boost. I'm sure. glad. I'm glad to hear that. And we're very very appreciative. We're very glad to have you aboard too. So um, before we get too much into because you know. I would have never thought in a million years that one of our most requested or sought over topics was compliance. Ne- never. Salespeople are so adverse to wanting to talk about compliance. But don't let people these know. days, it is, again, one of the number one topics of discussion. Yeah. And so, um, anyways, before we really get deep into it, you just got back. You were out of town last week. Yep. Um, just tell everybody kind of where you were, what you were up to. Give us kind of a brief rundown of um, CapCon and um, the activities and what it really stemmed around and maybe takeaways from it. Yeah. So uh, it was a NABIP CapCon. We were in Washington, D.C., right down the street from the Capitol building. Um, the goal of it was to work with legislators and talk with legislators, help them understand what's going on in our industry, and help them understand how they can help us be better in the industry and and uh, what pain points we see. The legislature that's coming up um, got to hear two heads at CMS, one on the ACA side and one on the Medicare side. Um, Hear directly from them, their pain points. Yeah, and I think one of the things that we've been pretty open about is that in in our perception, you know, we, we keep telling carriers, legislators, agents, agencies, everybody is... It's not all same, same. Like every agent is not the same and every NPN is not the same. And some NPNs work under a giant call center. Some NPNs, these call centers are buying leads from third-party sources and some of them are good and some of them are bad. And some of them are buying Joe Namath ads and some of them are, you know, but, you know, your NPN or an agent in the field who's, you know, working and networking with local partnerships and tax planners and working in community-based marketing is very different from a a broker with an NPN working in a call center, but they all just get painted with one big broad stroke. Yep. And so I think that 
we have frustration as us in the industry that that the view from Washington and from carriers is that it's all like one and the same when it's really not. Yeah. And and I think that's probably what we as an organization are trying to convey to legislators to try yep. to say like, hey, we, we are like, we want s- resolution to this too. We want solutions that are actually good, but we don't want this burdensome regulatory compliance that doesn't really affect change. Yeah. So. Yeah. Actually had the opportunity to meet with uh, several people on staff with Burgess Owens, John Curtis, you know, several different a couple of them that were on the Ways and Means Committee, and they are very interested in Probably how... Probably Blakemore, too. Yeah, Blakemore. Mm-hmm. You know, ways that we can affect change and how can they help drive some of that change as well. Yeah, one of our... When we had a recap meeting from that, one of the big takeaways was that you were pooled, so the way that it worked at this Capcom event, depending on the state you're from, so since you're yep. from Utah, it was potted out, so brokers who were attending or people from our industry attending this in D.C., you worked with your representation in your state, right? Yep. And one of our big takeaways is you were there with a group of people from Utah, yet nobody else had actual Medicare experience, correct? That's correct. So it's kind of this, for me, it was a big takeaway going, oh, my gosh. So even from an industry perspective, our legislators don't understand things really. Yep. They're voting on things, making, passing bills and putting things into – into effect, so to speak, to change our industry, they don't understand it. Their staffers barely get briefed, and then they're asking people from the industry to educate them, and yet we still didn't have people there who had Medicare experience. Right. So, right. so I'm glad you went. I'm glad we sent you. Yeah. So, it yeah. was it was a great experience to sit down. I mean, even down to one of the staffers wanted to know, you know, what's driving people going to more Medicare Advantage, and and what makes the difference. Um, and one of the people was mentioning, well, I think it's agents. I'm like, no, I think it's more the fact that it's more like what they're used to on their old group plans mm-hmm. and what they've yep. been with. It's it's more previously. comfortable than yeah. other options, really. More familiar. Mm-hmm. I, I would agree with that, and obviously it's like that whole exchange of value proposition, too, that's being offered, too, and, and some of it is agent broker behavior, but, you know, candidly, yep. Um, a lot of it is just the when you understand the product offering in the marketplace, right? That's why people are choosing it, right? And but I think they probably have a very big misunderstanding of it. I would assume. Yeah. So. Yeah. So that's that's good. We won't talk a ton more about Capcom because we'll we'll get into it throughout this discussion, like on the podcast. Absolutely. But um, before we keep going, what what do you really enjoy about three years in this role? You've been doing compliance for a lot of years, yeah. plural though. Um, what is it you really enjoy about the role and, and what are the things that quite frankly, uh, you, you really don't, but you got to do it. Like <laughs> what, g- give me the good, bad, the ugly. Uh, well in nine years, nine years is when I've, what I've been doing compliance, which is a long time mm-hmm. to have to read regs and understand regs and enforce regs. Um, some of the things I really like is working with the agents especially moving here and working more with the field-based agents. Right. It's been great to be able to have a discussion with them, help them understand more so. I mean, they do AHIP every year. Mm-hmm. And in theory, that's supposed to educate them on regulations. But you and I both know mm-hmm. you can't do AHIP and expect that you're going to gain everything that they need to know. Yeah, I mean, well, first and foremost, market. AHIP, like we're all salespeople, right? And salespeople are going to go, yeah, I'm going to – whatever, I'm going to click through, I'm going to read the Cliff Notes version of this and get through the end, and as long as I can pass a proficiency test that says yeah. I'm good to go, I just want the rubber stamp of approval so I can go sell, Correct. right? That's that's kind of the, the demeanor of most salespeople, which is, you know, pretty normal. Yeah. And so we as an organization know that, that no one's going to do AHIP one time and go, aha, I know exactly it everything I should and shouldn't be doing. Yeah. We know that typically concepts too, you have to reinforce into somebody's, you know, into their psyche and into like their processes three, four, five, six times yeah. before something really hits home and it resonates with them yeah. too. So. Um, things that I don't like. <laughs> yeah. I don't like having to sit down with agents and tell them what they've done wrong or yeah. what they've had to do, you know, what they've done that causes a problem after a complaint usually. Mm-hmm. And so it's a 
nobody wants to think they've ever done anything to hurt or harm right. anyone. But lo- watching enough sales presentations and listening to enough sales presentations, it's like you're not trying to hurt them. You just need to maybe have a little better process behind your Yeah, sale. I, th- I think I would say, and you can maybe – tell me if I'm right or wrong, but I would say 90% of the time we see things that are more like negligent or negligence where the person's not being thorough and they're not, they're being sloppy. They're not covering their bases and doing things. And it's more negligent. It's, it's rare or not as common where we're seeing people who are very intentionally being deceptive or doing things intentionally wrong. They don't do it intentionally. It's, it's usually something like, Hey, I think this plan has $50 in over the counter and it's really like 47 Right. Uh, Well, so it's not even intentional. Usually I would tell you, because we'll get into the weeds on all the things and the trends that you see. And we'll talk about it in a minute. But I think one of the trends that I saw over the past two years were the SSBCI benefits that were offered on certain plans where somebody obviously had to exhibit certain conditions in order to qualify for the SSBCI. But I'll even be honest, like in, in my opinion, the carriers were not very descriptive and didn't provide a lot of information to the brokers as to what specifically would qualify somebody to receiving those benefits or not. Yeah. So then an agent is trying to present these plan designs and benefits, and they're saying, yeah, you can get these extra benefits because of this SSBCI, but we don't even know if they're going to qualify or not. Right. That was one thing that I observed over the last two years. I think even just in the regulations, the regulations were very murky mm-hmm. the first year. Yep. And then I think as they saw the complaints roll in, they realized that they needed to – iron it out and make it clear like this is what they're intended for this is what they're intended to be and i think over the next couple years we'll see more of that as well yeah unfortunately i have news for everybody listening we are going to always be seeing more and more compliance it just is touching other realms so i think for me let's let's start talking about marketing compliance let's start talking about like the front end of it and start at the beginning and work our way back to the actual sales process and everything else so for marketing there's been a ton of changes just in the last two years changes there's been more in the last two years than the prior two decades oh easily Mm -hmm. in all of you or i's business Mm -hmm. time and business it's i've not seen regulation change like this just drastic. Drastic, yeah. yeah. So when I talk about the change, um, if you could expand and explain a little bit more, when we want to create a marketing piece now, yep. what do we have to do and what does that process look like versus what it was five years ago? Well, five years ago, if it was quote-unquote generic, mm-hmm. and I use quotes very yeah. loosely, right? generic, if I wanted to talk about Medicare or Medicare Advantage, but I didn't want to name drop any company, mm-hmm. As long as I didn't talk specific benefits, I didn't have to show it to a carrier. I didn't have to show it to CMS. I didn't have to show it to anybody. I just had to make sure that it was accurate and yeah, so not l- deceptive. I'm going to use an example yeah. so for our listeners. So a couple years ago, I could have actually just created a marketing piece, hired a graphic designer, and made a postcard, a flyer, whatever else. And I could have said in this context, like, hey, contact me. I'm, I'm the best local insurance agent out there yeah. and i'm not saying that the plan is the best or i'm saying that i'm the best out there locally and i could have mocked it up and made my own thing and then just ran to print and gone to market and i can yep. do that and you i would could. have been perfectly fine you right could. and and or i could have said you know contact me i'll make sure you save money and find the right coverage and it was generic and i could just do that and make it look very professional yep. or i could go the other route and make that generic piece look government official black and white font and text and make it yep. look like oh is this it's coming from, from the social security or, or medicare or whatever and you could have almost made these very generic pieces seem like it's government official yeah and we see i see advertising pieces kind of going both those ways where it's either under the guise where something seems and looks and kind of feels like it's government yep. or it's that other path but you could certainly do all that generic marketing no approval process. You just make it. You do. You go run with it. Yep. And you're fine. Yep. And now that's different. Correct. It is. The the very def- definition of marketing. If you're targeting, and it's obvious. If you're mentioning dental, vision, hearing, 
SSBCIs, the mm -hmm. flex cards, all those things, if you're mentioning any of those, even in a generic fashion, it's now considered marketing. Yep. Has to go to every carrier that you want to represent yep. with it. And then after every carrier opts in, then we have to file it with CMS. Yep. So and so that people listening understand when we're telling you too, we, we tell brokers, send us your marketing pieces so that yep. we can look at them and review. What we typically do is we'll do our first round of edits and say, hey, we're not even going to submit these to carriers yet because I can already tell you they're all going to get denied. Yep. You're going to wait a week or two or whatever to get yep. the denial. Just change these things first, then send them back to us, right? So we, yeah. we kind of do a first look on them. I do. I do a first look and kind of look at the, make sure you don't have the best or the most or the highest ranked or any of those. Or you're quoting the buyback amount for a Florida plan and you're going to market it in another state or right. yeah, something like that. Yeah. Right? So I do that first look and decide, you know, is this ready to send to a carrier? Yep. Then at that point, um, once you've done all your edits, I have to have it in a specific format to even be able to send it to the carriers. So they want it in an editable Word format. Yep. And they want it sent to them. If you send it in PDF, they'll mark it up in PDF. So PDF or Word is the two formats that most of the carriers will accept. And, and just, Heather's saying PDF, or Word, but just understand if you have like a web page, we still have to send out your, if you have a consumer facing web page yep. that talks about it, we have to send that off. If you have social media posts, you actually have to create the, the images of what the copy and the text and everything yeah. is going to be. And so we have to approve social campaigns, websites, yep. radio ads, newspaper, yep. direct mail, yep. all of it. And right? if you're going to send me a social, a uh, media ad or you want to do a radio ad or any of those things I have to have the actual script the exact words you're going to say mm -hmm. so that I can send that to the carrier correct um our very favorite is all the disclaimers that now have to be mm -hmm. read and I think the hardest part is it depends on what you say in the ad as to what disclaimers have to be said. Yeah, well, and here's the other hard so. thing, too. Candidly, let's say you want to do a three-by-five postcard. You want to send a direct mail postcard that's only this big. <laughs> you don't have much room to put even an advertisement, and you've got a disclaimer in whatever font that you've got to fit it on. Your disclaimers take up 25% of your advertising real exactly. estate. Exactly. So it, it has made it extremely complex, but that's one of those things that, you know, we kind of tout and say, absolutely, we you are very readily available and accessible to yeah. a lot of our agents and agency partners. Yep. And we're trying to tell them we want to, you know, we it's an investment into you to have as a resource for um, all of our affiliates so that we're following the rules, we're following yeah. the guidelines, and people can go to market and feel confident. And, you know? and I will say, Dan, a lot of the pieces that I get from our brokers, most of the time I don't have to make a lot of edits. Good. Because they've listened to the feedback that I've given them before they even create them. So beautiful. Those that I've had interactions with are very open to the feedback. So yeah, I they're already ninety percent of the way there. Yeah, and I will say too, it's 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 common that we'll submit to let's say seven carriers, and here's where it's hard for us, and I keep pushing back to carriers on this too. Is let's say you submit a marketing piece to seven carriers. Yep. Five of them opt in and say, yes, yes, yeah. And then two yeah, of them say, go. oh, we're not going to opt into that. Well, that's like really hard for us on this distribution side because let's say the agent gets five opt-ins and then two not. How does the broker go to market well and actually go promote products? And then they're like, oh, it turns I out. I can't give you that carrier. And, and I'm just using examples. Oh, it turns out Humana didn't opt in, but that was the plan that you sold. Oh, now you're in compliance, hot water. Right. That's the one thing that I think I keep saying is very broken in this process because yeah. how does the broker know these five opted in but not those two? So when I go talk to this one lead who responded yes, I got to talk about everybody except for those two companies' yeah. products. That's the I gymnastics, the mental gymnastics to try to even do that yeah. are just so unrealistic that it's wild. That's one of the hardest parts about the regs is that I can read the regs one way, right. you can read the regs one way, a broker can read the regs and get something else. But ultimately, every carrier has their own attorney mm -hmm. who interprets it. Yep, LNC. And one attorney might interpret it and be like, on the line, letter of the law, this is what we're doing. And then you got another carrier that's like loosey-goosey that's like, well, 
Well, I think, but it also fits. some different carriers, you know, payers, however you want to describe them, insurance companies, they all have a different appetite for risk too. Yes. And so it just depends where you might have a couple who are like, I am zero risk adverse. I'm taking none. Yeah. And other people are like, yeah, we want some business. We want to grow. We'll, we're okay. We'll, yeah. we'll accept a little bit of a uh, gray in here. And, you know, if we get slapped on the wrist two years down the road, yeah, we'll, we'll deal with it. Yeah. You know, so it just, you find that some of these carriers have a little different demeanor. It's not the same across the board. Exactly. So that's all. And, but it also causes a lot of pain for us as a third party to try to work with their legal and compliance departments, understand like their position on certain things yeah. and go, okay, this isn't an industry thing. This is just your interpretation. Right. Which is not necessarily the interpretation of anybody else. Yeah. So. I, and I do say, I will say because of our relationships with carriers, I feel like we have a bit of an in because they recognize that we are one of the FMOs, one of the companies that's trying to do it the right way. Correct. So they'll work with us a lot more. I would say this too. I, I you know, and I kind of wear a lot of hats as CEO and part of yep. it's compliance and sales and strategy and all these other things. But I will tell people from my observation in compliance is when the agent is attempting and trying to do the right thing and they really are like, you can see characteristics or traits like when CTMs come in or complaints or things oh yeah. and you talk to the broker and sometimes they're just like, I just, I didn't think about that or I didn't, you know, you can see what their intentions were and right. that they weren't trying to break the rules or be nefarious. Those honest mistakes happen. And I always tell brokers, you're usually going to be just fine. And yeah. um, it's it's usually when agents are seeing the rules and interpreting them. And they're like, hey, I need to make sure and operate just right outside of that because I'm not going to do it. And they're being very intentional about how trying to circumvent everything. Yep. That's when the behavior and the intention almost becomes very apparent when you're kind of doing all your fact finding. Absolutely. And those are the people that usually get in hot water and get the book thrown at them. They usually in, do. In my opinion. And they're usually the ones that when I talk to them and try and help them see the behavior and they're not changing the behavior. Right. It's like, you know what? I'm, I'm here to defend you. Right. But if you're not willing to take feedback. Right. You're tying my hands. Yeah, and I, mean, I really can't. It's, it's going to be pretty hard to justify the next complaint, or if somebody wants to terminate right. your contract, you know, if you've already been coached on it, we told you not to, or we told you not to run that piece, and you did it anyway because, well, it was performing really good and got me a lot of sales. It's like, well, you know, if sorry, if, if something comes up again in two or three months, we we can't do anything to help you. Right. Yeah. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. And that's and that's not. I wouldn't say that's common. It's more rare. It's not common. Um, but I would say, from my observation. Let's let's talk about field agents and then phone agents. Yep. But in my observation, some of the the common compliance issues that I see from field agents yep. are the above. And you can add to my list. Number one, um, rarely do they properly file their educational or sales events properly. That's one I see. People are popping up shop in Walmarts or XYZ or the grocery yep. store or the health fair or the senior center, wherever it may be rarely are they filing or reporting events like you know there's guidelines about when and you should and should yeah. and everything else but rarely are they, do, are they doing it correctly um the, the second one is i still see a lot of people you know in places where people are receiving care in doctor's offices and pharmacies very close i see that one pretty often yep the other one i would tell you um with with field agents is um door knocking i still see that as a pretty blatant violation that people are just showing up on the doorstep which you shouldn't be doing you know if you're yeah. listening and saying like i got this card in the mail and i haven't been able to reach you i called you 17 times so now i'm just here you know yeah. that but i bought a lead so i'm just here on your doorstep right um that's another one th i'm seeing from field and then lastly i still see a lot of kind of more field-based you know community type agents that are not when they're doing enrollments over the phone, they're still not recording and storing properly. That would be, that's my checklist from what I see. Yeah. Is that in alignment there's, with uh, what you see? There's also, I've seen a few that, uh, you know, some of the older agents who haven't converted over to electronic. Yep. And they forget to submit their applications in a timely fashion. And they're sandbagging those apps, huh? Sandbagging them. Yep. yep. I could see that. And you talk to them, and the hard thing is you tell them once, like, hey, it's it's like two days not like two business days either right you take that app two on a friday calendar days it, it's you're not i'll submit it monday and i'm good so 
Yeah, so I, I would say that one's pretty common too. Those yeah. are the trends or the things that I see from the field. Yep. Now, the phone agents, yep. um, what I observe from the phone agents, and this is not just our distribution but other um, carriers as well, I think that it's really challenging in this environment to do everything, single thing perfect on a phone call. It is. And everything is under scrutiny. And I absolutely hate that element about the teledigital or telesales world right now is every single call – it's the disclaimers at the beginning, and yep. now they've added more, Yep. Um, which is, you know, what is it? I do not represent every plan in yeah, my area. Yeah, you got to figure out how many carriers you represent and how many plans they have. And Now, here's the thing, and, and CMS can even hear this podcast and slap my wrist for it. I've told all the brokers, look, look, I know they said within the first 60 seconds, it's really hard to do. Sometimes yeah. you're in that phone call, and they start picking up, and they're even confused as to who you are, why you're calling and you're having to try to explain who you are and the purpose of your call, Yep, it's hard to even get to the disclaimer in the first 60 seconds. My guidance to agents has been, I don't get me wrong, so just, I've been, yep. hey, if you get to that disclaimer in the first minute and a half or two minutes because of this initial talk track and rapport and explaining who you yep. are and then saying, hey, okay, before we proceed, I need to review this disclaimer. Just And if, as long as you do that, I haven't seen carriers pushing back saying, no. This occurred at the one minute and 42 second mark instead of within the no. first 60. What I've seen is carriers saying, you didn't say it at all. Right. I think so they again. They want it said, I think that's they're not being strict yeah, about it. Yeah, and I'm not speaking for CMS, but I think that the, the spirit of the law is that you're, as an agent, before you're proceeding with like a sales interaction, that you're reading that disclaimer. So yeah. just do it at the front end of the phone call. I think from my experience, you're going to be good, even if it's not at... 47 second mark in the phone call yeah. and then so i think disclaimers are a big thing that people don't do yep. um the other thing we have like an, an anatomy of a compliant phone call that we, we give do. everybody it's like a very thorough checklist of all the things they should be yes. asking um you know talking to that consumer about yeah um all those find out questions addressing everything we find that the um agents don't follow the anatomy of the compliant call Correct. And so the complaints that we see are more people don't check doctors appropriately or at all. Yep. And they don't check medications very thoroughly. We we have some agents that have done work at other call centers, and previously their instructions were just you have ask. To just ask and give yeah. them the opportunity. And if the person declines or doesn't care, then just proceed. Yeah. I hate that because candidly, you know, you're going to enroll them on a plan you don't even know if it covers their medications and at what cost and at what tier right. and at what pharmacy and can they even keep going to see Paul at the local pharmacy or not or is that going to be non-preferred on the new plan yep. And yep. or using mail order? I mean, to not even have a discussion about all that is wild to me. Yeah. Um, I think if I could wrap it up into one pretty little package, it's doing a good needs analysis. Right. And making sure that the plan is suitable for what that beneficiary needs mm -hmm. and that they understand how it's going to benefit them. Even the ones that we get that are, you know, not permission to enroll or oh, I didn't yeah. give them permission to enroll. I go back and listen to the call and you listen to the to the agent, either the consumer asked a question and they just glossed over it and half answered the question mm -hmm. or completely avoided the question altogether. Right. Um, the second piece of it that I see with those is when they're concerned about the plan. And so the beneficiary maybe calls after the sale. Yeah. And the agent takes three, four, five days to return their phone call. Of course they're going to complain because they're yep. going, hey, I got a concern. I need it addressed and you're not addressing it. So I'm just going to call and complain to the carrier. Yep. I'll, I will even say this too, that people want, like, so if you're in sales, and you have a client, yep. and you sell somebody, and they're calling you. Whenever your phone's ringing, I tell people it's money. If you're in sales and your phone is ringing, answer the freaking phone. It's money. Yep. Even if it's a client that's current client, you're probably somehow incentivized financially to take care of that person ongoing Absolutely. or get referrals or X or Y or Z. Answer the freaking phone. Yep. And to your point, when somebody, l let's say you, you're, you're legitimately on other calls, you get a voicemail from a customer, and they say, hey, Dan, you put me on this plan, and then I try, tried to fill my medication, and I couldn't, and they told me it doesn't cover it, and I'm really pissed off, and I'm so mad. I need you to call me. 
like we see some agents just shut down. They're like, oh my gosh, this person's upset with me. Yeah. I'm not going to call them back. I'm going to, well, I'm going to avoid them. That, yeah. I'm going to avoid them. It is so much worse for the agent yeah. if they do that. The best thing to do is to call that person back and go, I got your voicemail. What is going on? Can you walk me through it? Oh my gosh. Let me check into the plan that yeah, I enrolled you on. Figure it out. Let me see what's going on. You know, I, I'll just be honest, y- you know, and let's just say you made a mistake. Let's say you did. Yeah. I mean, it's better to talk to that person and say, you know what, God, I've only been in this job for a month or something like that. Yep. Or to say, I just was, must have had like my senior moment. I must have just had that, that day where I screwed up. I'm really sorry. Nine times out of 10 doing that, they're not going to make a complaint. No. Even if you just talk to that person and own it and say, I'm a human. I'm sorry. I screwed up. Yep. Let's find a way to fix it. Let's try to get you back onto your old plan then. Let's see if there's another plan we can do. Even I've had agents say, dude, the best thing to do is even you can get on the phone with CMS and you can even call them and just be like, I'm on the line. I'm an agent. Yep, it was me. Human error. Yep. Um, nothing intentional here. Can you award them an SCP for this? Because, you know, I didn't know X, Y, Z. I'm not hiding from the problem. I'm here trying to fix it. Right. When people display that kind of behavior, they're going to be all right. Yeah. You know? And the carriers look at it that way as well. Mm-hmm. Like if you... Obviously, being that I'm on the, our side and I'm trying to defend the agent, I'm not going to tell the carrier right. that, hey, I see five missed phone calls and they didn't return the call. But that's definitely a discussion I'm going to have with the agent and say, hey, this could be avoided. Yep. Return their phone call. <laughs> yep. And while we're on the topic of compliant and we're, we're just going through all this, what I think a lot of agents don't understand, we're seeing some of the, the oversight – and administration of compliance from the carriers changing as well. Yes. And part of that, people mm-hmm. don't understand, we actually have a tracker. So, like, whenever we have an agent who, let's say, they have six contracts with us on all those carriers, we actually track across all carriers because an insurance carrier, they're only going to see what they see, your number of sales and those complaints, but they don't have visibility with what that broker is doing with other carriers. Yep. We have visibility on all of it. And so what we do in a very, like, what I would say comprehensive and effective compliance program yep. is we're having to say, okay, here it is with, with Cigna, with United Healthcare, with, with you know, um, WellCare, with whoever, Humana. Yeah. Here's all of our different carriers. And if you see a trend with an agent where it's like they get a, a compliance point with one carrier, but then they have the same type of complaint with a different carrier, yep. we're tracking that across all of the carriers, yeah. right? Um, and trying to coach and prevent and solve that immediately. Um, that's kind of why the carriers rely on us to enforce that's that because we have that visibility that they don't, Yeah. right? Well, and that's part of what, you know, CMS has started to ask the carriers is that we're supposed to report to the carriers right. trends that we see. Correct. And so they're also one of the things that changed in the last year. Some of the carriers have said, has the agent been terminated by any other carriers because the one thing that they're trying to eliminate which i'm perfectly fine with is if an agent has bad selling practices and they have some issues and they sell a boatload with one carrier and suddenly they get terminated then they just remove their cap selling this one carrier put it on with another put it on with another and they're back in business doing the same thing with a different carrier same bad behavior or they're flipping their book to somebody else and just doing the same thing um, back in business and i think they're trying to prevent that and so they're now asking and saying has this agent been terminated by any other carriers and you're supposed to say yeah so if they are it can really affect you know it's not going to be the next time in a year or two or three years when they go to pull backgrounding it's they're going to try to solve that immediately and not wait well i think too one thing that some agents don't recognize you've got a national producer number right a national producer number i like to tell them it's like like your new social security number. Yeah. It follows you everywhere you go. It does. So no matter whether you are with Agent Boost Marketing or XYZ Agency in the industry, like that history is going to follow you. Yes. So if you don't change the behavior here and you think you're going to go somewhere else and try and sell again, it follows you. Yeah, and that's really important. I, I think I, I'm glad you brought that up. Because for agents who sell final expense or life products, we're used to vectors. You know, like if you've been selling life insurance, you get chargebacks. We call it like tote the note, you know, like a repo car, you know, around town. In the final expense side, 
you sell these products, suddenly you get these chargebacks, you get $4,000 in chargebacks with this company. Oh, I'm just not going to sell AmM anymore. I'm going to go sell, you know, Americo now instead. Yep. And then, oh, I got a chargeback with Americo. Oh, now I'm going to go sell Great Western or whatever it may be. And then they're floating around and eventually they put a vector on you and then the carriers start terminating you and saying, we're not appointing you, you have yeah. a vector. And it's becoming the same thing in our industry with that NPN where it does follow you. And we've had a few over these that just thought like, well, yeah, my gig is up here. I, I got... I'm going to try over here. I, we're like, you don't understand. Like, it's not like we didn't like terminate you. You got termed from like the carrier. Yeah. And, and so now, you know, if you go try to get a job somewhere else, they might offer you a job, but then the moment they start to try to appoint you with carriers and can't, you're not going to have that job anymore because right. you can't perform the work. Like you're, yeah. you're just done. Well, and so. a lot of the applications now even ask you, have you been terminated for cause? Right, right. So, so. It, it is changing, and I think that's one thing that is at least positive, and we're trying to help people understand, like, this isn't something that you can run from and avoid. You have right. to embrace this. This has to be part of your world. We are a sales organization. We want sales, but you have to do it in the right way yep. and know what you're doing. There's such an emphasis on it. And remember that you have a professional license. Right. Just like a doctor, just like a lawyer, you have a professional license. Yeah. With your name. And we, ha we so. haven't even talked about, you know, Department of Insurance and all yeah. these other things that you're potentially, you know, liable before. I think right. that people, it's so easy to get your insurance license, though, and pass a test. And people are like, oh, yeah, I got my my fancy little number here. Now I can just get a license, stick it on business. And they right. kind of forget along the way that you're actually a licensed insurance agent. Yeah. Yeah. So you have a fiduciary responsibility. Responsibility. Here. Yeah. It's a little interesting. So, yeah, Medicare, ooh, we could go on forever, I think, and just talk compliance for Medicare. I but I think we've conveyed there's crazy amounts of marketing on the front end now. There's a very significant, um, I guess I would say, focus on field agents now and having them re record calls and everything, every yeah. interaction be recorded. Now, you know, a lot of field agents were trying to say, oh, well, this wasn't marketing. This was just me servicing my clients or X, Y. This was a communication thing and not yeah. sales. But most of those things are falling under the sales category and not communication. Yep. Um, that's evolved a lot. Just the, the, the disclaimers that you have to say and read are becoming very cumbersome. Um, really a lot, a lot of compliance in Medicare. So Absolutely. look, whether it's us or somebody else or anywhere, just make sure if you're listening, you're doing business with an agency or an FMO or somebody that has the resources to kind of steer you. you in the right direction and make sure that, you know, God forbid, you know, someone's going to get terminated just because they don't know that they shouldn't be doing something. So just yeah. make sure you're aligned somewhere that can help you with that. Um, well, let's talk about ACA which and health, which at the moment – is the exact opposite of Medicare, which is. seems like is still the wild, wild west, and there's no rules. Because um, that is, you know, I, I the irony of it, and we've, we've, we've had so many of these podcast episodes where we're saying it's going to meet in the middle. But for right yeah. now, the irony is it's funny because CMS is under health and human services. So you have health and human service, the left hand, the right hand. Here you got Medicare, and here you got regular health. Yep. Medicare is like compliance all the way up to my colon for everything. Absolutely. ACA is like, eh, I'm like, I think there's fraud going on here. And they're like, eh, we're going to let it go. Yeah. You know, it's just like almost, there's almost no guidelines to anything. Very few things. And we'll talk about consent in a minute and how yep. that's like the very first thing. But what a weird stark comparison between selling health products on someone under 65 and over 65. Yeah. I think, I mean, it's been in the in around, what, 10 years now? Yeah, it is actually hit the 10-year mark, just barely, the yeah. Affordable Care Act. Yep. Call it ACA, Obamacare, whatever you want to call it, just yep. hit the 10-year mark. This last open enrollment, we hit 3.2 new, new enrollees mm -hmm. and 10 million mm -hmm. new. Yep. 23 million lives covered under ACA now. It, but it grew by 30% in one year. 30%, 75% in the last three years. So just those are staggering statistics. So everybody's <laughs> known because they're going – yeah, and I thought you weren't doing ACA and getting into health. And I was like, look, we were waiting for a lot of the chaos to shake out with the co-ops and everything else with yeah. ACA. It was kind of, um, you know, pardon my friend, it was a shit show for the first couple it of years. It was crazy. And so now it's it's really stabilized. And obviously there's a right time. We felt like it was the right time to enter. 
but yeah, it's it's now become a very stable product. Yeah. And um and to your point, um, anyways, I think we're gonna start seeing a lot more of those regulations starting to creep in because yeah. of the growth. We've seen those first couple of years, while it was messy, there wasn't as much growth because it was so challenged yeah. and messy. Now we're seeing, like you said, 75% growth in the last three years, 30% in this last year. The number of enrollees are just staggering and growing yeah. every year. Currently, there's only 86,000 registered brokers nationwide. Did you hear that? No. It's only 86,000 brokers registered selling those products. So it's uh, there's an opportunity. Mm-hmm. So if you're selling Medicare, <laughs> yep, it's a good time to get in. Yeah, and and I would tell people too, like you know, I think you should always identify what your core or lead product is or who you are. So like for having that identity, saying like, hey, either I'm a a Medicare agent who's also going to offer ACA for yeah. a spouse when you you. You know, you're selling somebody turning 65 and their spouse is 61 years old. Right. You're already there. You already have the relationship. You can do it. Or maybe you're a health person that's just selling health and you're like, oh, I'll sell Medicare in addition just because, you know, you're going to... turning 65. Yeah, there's those cross-selling opportunities yeah. or XYZ referral opportunities. But I think people have to have a pretty di- defined idea as to who Where they, they are go. as yeah. a business owner and how they're going to market and how they're doing that. But I think they should know, but it's, Absolutely. but it's very easy to do both lines of business. It is. So, um, but yeah, so ACA to kind of, or health insurance or under 65 or IFP or whatever we want to yep. call it, whatever you call um, it. has very little regulation right now. If you want to advertise and say, Hey, I want to, you know, offer health insurance and make a flyer who approves it. Nobody. Nobody. There is <laughs> no process. So if I'm like, Nobody. hey, uh, I'm the best insurance agent in the state of Utah, and I give people affordable health plans, and I'm the best, yeah. and I can just make a flyer and go to market, and I'm good. We've we've also seen, you know, different companies going to market with, hey, we got a rewards program, so join this and get yeah. $500 in rewards. And, and, and I even love the government themselves are saying, 80 or 90, what was the percentage of people pay zero? $9 or, $9 yeah. or less. And they're actually the ones touting and saying, almost everybody pays nothing. Like, yeah. y- you know, get on board with this. And they're the ones running those ads. Very, yep. very a, a different tone from the Medicare side. The I think the interesting thing, too, is they're almost in the lead industry as well because mm-hmm. they've got the help on demand and yep. they refer you. Yeah, and so for those that Leads. don't understand, it's is you can when you're registered on the marketplace, you're there, and when people in that geo area are looking for health benefits, your name pops up, yep. and they will create and send you a lead yep. as well. The actual government, you yeah, know, for people, which is which is cool for brokers. Yeah. So um, this last open enrollment, about seventy six percent of enrollments happened assisted by an agent. So there's a lot of people getting enrolled. 76% of people were enrolled by an agent of one of those 86,000 agents, right? Yeah. So, which is pretty cool statistically wise. Yeah. Um, the other thing I would say is when I sell somebody, let's say at the kitchen table or over the phone with ACA, what kind of a script do I have to follow? There's no script. There's no script. Okay. So there's no sell script. I don't have to prove my marketing. And then what about disclaimers? There's no disclaimers. Okay. There's no disclaimers either. Well, let me take that back. Your consent oh, right. is the only disclaimer that you have to use. Yep. So we've talked about consent once before on the podcast, but it was yeah. just this year for 20, well, 2023. July. Yeah, this that they 2023. said, hey, everybody, guess what? From now on, you have to have consent from somebody yeah. to enroll and sign them up into their health insurance plan. Yep. It was like, oh, that's, was that not a thing before? Like, how was this? How is it? So what you mean to tell me is that people were just signing people up for plans before without even having their legal consent to? And it was Sometimes like, yes. Sometimes not even talking to the agent. Right, never. Like never we're, we're talking, talking. They just got a lead and they were like, ah, oh, I see enough information to go complete an application. I'm just going to go do an application for the person. Yeah. Done. Yeah. I'm the broker of record. All it took, and it's still all it takes to pull their application is their name and their date of birth. Yep. That's so. it. So if somebody is providing their name and date of birth on a lead card or lead information, yep. that's all the broker needs to go in and start doing an application form, for sure. which is wild. It is wild. But at the same time, 
you know, you kind of look and I say, it is a little wild out there right now in health insurance and ACA. And for those people who are saying, hey, they need to step in and change this, remember, be careful what you wish for. Yes. When you're asking the government to come in and fix it, you may not like the outcome that we're going to get from it. Yeah. So, and it's and it feels like the change is already starting to come. Yeah. We're feeling it a little more. Well, what the head of ACA, when we were back at Capcom, said is yeah. agents need to be part of the solution. Mm-hmm. So make sure you're getting your consent. Yes. And be part of the solution. So obviously, like so. in in that realm and that product. You just have to have consent from the person. You can do their application. We saw what I would call a very fraudulent activity by some people Uh, this last year where we would write thousands of applications, and we actually are talking to the people. We're getting them on the phone. We're buying compliant, you know, leads. We're – or generating compliant leads, one of the two. Yeah. And then we're actually talking to the person and saying, you know, what – you know, do you have any concerns, things that you need to make sure are covered and treated, your medications, and where do you want access care, and what doctor do you want to see, and do you want to have a higher deductible with, you know, an HSA, or do you want to have, like, a lower, yep. like a silver, or what do you want? We're having these conversations, pushing the enrollment, and then, you know, 10 minutes before midnight at the end of the month, we got bots in another call center going in and just, just stealing them all the away. piece of business, and you're like, H- how is this even possible mm-hmm. you know and there's no incentive for organizations like ours to sit there and try to do the right thing and fact find and you know try to place them on the right coverage plan because then you just got a bad actor that's going to come in the back door and just pull it away yank it with a bot and an ede at the end of the month absolutely it's been wild it has been see. wild so if that's been one thing that's a little bit still crazy out there i know that resonates with some of you all because we've heard from brokers who are going man, this is so crappy. I, I made like 25 new, you know, members this yep. month in ACA. And then at the end of the month, I talked to them and I'm only getting paid for 10 on my book of business. And yep. they don't, those other 12 people, I, I call them and be like, hey, did, did I do something wrong or did I screw something up? No, what are you talking about? And they yeah. don't even know that they got ripped away or pulled onto a different plan. What I would say as well is diversify in your states because mm-hmm. there's definitely some, rampant fraud in some of the top states. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's other states that are less served, which yes. is, I think that's what we're trying to help brokers see and do as a company ourselves. Yeah. There's Diversify. And, and I guess I won't get into the weeds on the particular carriers and areas and everything else like that, but we've had to learn those lessons the hard way and just know there's certain carriers and geo areas that we stay away from because of the rampant activity that we're seeing there. Yeah. And, and candidly, a lot of what I would call being fraudulent or completely unethical, and you report it to Health and Human Services, and you report it to Health Sherpa, you report it everywhere, and they're like, mm, "Can't it's, do anything about it's, it." It's not really uh, illegal, and you're like, "Huh? Okay, so well, should I do that behavior then? Because they yeah. are like, are we supposed to do this? You know, well, it's a weird thing." CMS even admitted some of the hardest part about the consent thing mm-hmm. is that. I go in and get consent today. You go in and get consent tomorrow. Another agent goes in and gets consent a week from now. They're all valid. We all have consent. We all have consent. Just like the Spider-Man meme. Yeah. And we're all pointing each other going, wait, do you have, I have permission. Do you have permission? Yeah, we all have permission. Fine. Let's knife fight in the street for this <laughs> right? policy. You know, it's it's crazy. Yeah, it is And crazy. it's like, I well, you put them on a net. No, I want to get paid. I'm putting them on an Ambetter. I put them on a UHC. And right. the person goes to show up and access health care. And they're like, what card do I show? I, I don't even know what my plan is. Yeah. You know, it's super wild right now. It is wild. But it's it it hopefully will get better. Did they yes. did they talk about any upcoming changes or have you had conversations with carriers or with the folks in Capcom in some other I guess you would say guardrails or things that they're doing as far as health some insurance and ACA? Some things that they are at CMS specifically talked about. Um getting rid of working on eliminating or reducing duplicate applications because that's one of the biggest problems Mm -hmm. is, you know, go in and do an application one day and then something changes rather than going into the first application, an agent will just create a whole new application. Mm. So make sure if there's an existing application that you use Existing. existing application rather than creating a whole new application. Um, they did talk about also just making sure that um, 
you're watching the data that you're actually entering on the applications, the names, the date of births, the social security numbers specifically. Yep. So making sure that your information matches what's actually on their social security card. That's that's a novel idea. Yeah. Isn't it? You know, no, we, we kind of joke about that in a very kind of facetious manner, but some of these things are very um, avoidable. I mean, yeah. the, some of these things are a very easy fix. Other things are more challenging. I would say before we kind of wrap up and finalize, the, the biggest kind of going back to all of it, like compliance as a theme, I think in the each side of the house, like whether it be Medicare or ACA, they have their own challenges. They do. The, in, as I look at like Medicare and I say that the challenge is, you know, we have what we all perceive are a handful of very bad actors in the business who are very large and who have kind of gotten away with murder over the last couple of years. And then it has placed a very unfair burden on everybody else in the yep. Medicare space. And then you look at the ACA and it's there's no compliance or regulation, and so you, or very little, excuse yeah. me, very very little, and so then it just is kind of almost a free for all that's occurring, and so you kind of have two very different sets of problems yeah. right now. So that's that's how I view it. That's how I would summarize it to anybody who is asking really I my agree. opinion. So, anyways, any last thoughts or takeaways before we before we really wrap up, Heather? Um, I would just say as an agent. I'm here as a resource. I'm not your enemy. <laughs> so please utilize my services. Let me help you do what's right. And if you don't understand, I'm happy to help you. So Good. reach out. Very much, very much appreciate that. That's, you know, I'll just, I guess as a sign off, since you said it, it's, you know, compliance at agentboost.com. Yes, it is. It actually goes right to you. And for those agents who are kind of aligned with this already, you hear from many of them. They just call you directly and say, hey, yeah. Heather, they I'm have thinking myself about on. this. And <laughs> what about that? And so we appreciate everything you do, Heather. Yep. So thank you. So this is round one on compliance, I'm sure, because it's been a, a hot topic. We'll probably have you back on at some point. But um, anyways, appreciate you all. We'll catch you next week. Agent Boost.